Welcome, Perth. Hi, familiar faces. Alrighty, click is working. Let's check. Oh, there you go. Look at that, a QR code. Get your phones out. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming down. Let's just get a show of hands before we begin. Who here, it's their first time to an Aus DeFi Association event? For me, I always feel like it's the first time, so um, I'm with you. Uh, thanks for joining. This is a blockchain technology investment crypto Web3 advocacy group. We run these monthly meetups thanks to the awesome folks here like Ronan who has uh, kindly donated his speakers and whatnot. Um, I am recording this and I do have to check, just, just mind one second because we're going to put this on YouTube so that the good folks who didn't get to see it, um, they get the FOMO. And so I'll be recording. So whoever's speaking is going to have one of these attached to them. Uh, we've got the clicker here as well. So um, sorry, that QR code, if you did grab it, it's got a whole heap of links on there. The meetup links, newsletter, website, Discord. Discord's kind of dead, but we will still post stuff uh, up on there as well as Twitter and uh, a few other things. All right, hopefully you got it. We'll, we'll bring it back if you weren't able to. All right, so um, a, a big set of events today. Uh, we've got SJ from Sterling and Rose, Phil from uh, Phil talking about Cardano stuff. We've got Tracy and Blake here from uh, Bamboo, Sophie and Karis all the way from the Middle East. Thank you, Karis, for joining us. And uh, I'll get it underway so that we can I think we're a little bit behind in terms of time, but that's okay. I can talk fast. And look, if it's too fast, you just slow it down when you watch the replay. All right, so Sydney, where we started, we do these events over there. This is where it all began. We do the monthly events, and we're so lucky to have grown out to other places. So what happened there? We had Block Damon on the left come in from Singapore, and then we had uh, Rob from CloudTech there launching a new stablecoin called Ubiquity. So keep an eye out for them. Um, they're one of our main sponsors. Then we also had some lawyers uh, from KWM who have been in this space for a long time. There's a lot of lawyers in this space. Are there any lawyers here? Anyone from, oh yes, yes, thank you, thanks for joining. Uh, anyone from government, ATO, APRA, ASIC? If you're from ASIC, you have to tell me. Okay. Anyway, so it was some great events. As you can see, we're sponsored by Domino's, not, um, and, and tonight as well. So uh, Melbourne, they've got a really cool place over there uh, at the CloudTech offices is called the ANNG Gallery. I thought the G stood for gallery, but no, it's ANNG Gallery, just like ATM machine. Um, so really cool spot that they've got out there. So if you're ever in Melbourne, definitely check out their events. Oh, look, the last Perth event. So um, some familiar faces there. Thanks for everyone that was there at that one. And um, who knows Real Vision, Rao Pal? A few of you guys know. Yes, very good. Uh, lucky to be involved with a group that uh, brought him down to Sydney. He's very tall. I thought I was six foot, I'm not. Um, no, he's, he's, he's a really cool guy, really down to earth, and it was really cool to get his stories about how he got into this space coming from Goldman's and um, his views and opinions on things. He spoke about decentralized wine. So people go like, where's the real world value and stuff? It's like, well, wine, you can actually get some really cool blockchain things where as soon as you drop a device, um, so they've got a smart cork type of device where basically uh, you can get data as soon as someone's opened a bottle, even after 10 years, that it tells you when they're consuming it. So you get patterns of purchase, but you don't get patterns of consumption when it comes to some of these um, things like wine that get held over many years. So now they're doing that. So Club Devin was the group that we brought down there, which is really good. And uh, Blockchain Week. So I know that there was some stuff here in Perth as well for Blockchain Week. Hands up who went to that, any Blockchain Week stuff. Yep, a few of you. Thank you, thank you. Um, here we go. So that was in Sydney. Uh, so if there were, you know, some interesting things that were going on there, uh, I think there's going to be like some replays that they might uh, put out later on. But they changed their name, so it's much more mainstream focus now. Now it's going to be called the Digital uh, Digital Economy Council of Australia (DECA). So it means it brings in not just like the banks and payment firms, but even groups like Telstra, anyone that's doing finance, commerce, etc. That's all part of this now because blockchain is going mainstream. So it's a really good sign. And then uh, we've got a podcast. The last one that I had on was over if you're ever in Sydney. I mean, it's hard to tell, but in the background there, because it is nighttime, you see the Opera House. And so that was really good. This is Hannah from KWM. Um, I've got a guest on next week. I forget who it is, but it should be fun. I think it's Tim from Red Belly Network. So a lot of blockchain stuff. We'll also talk about AI as well. And then uh, I'm starting one with a guy that does my filming. Uh, his name is Chris uh, from Digital Village. 
We're going to try to make it a bit more fun in terms of talking about blockchain, AI, uh, digital innovation, etc. So um, with that, uh, where are we up to? I'm going to talk about something else, but I'll skip that for now. I'm going to go straight to SJ. So don't ignore the slides. There we go. SJ from Selling a Rose, please come on down. Hello, everyone. Did you have a good lot of pizza and drinks? Yeah, excellent. Um, I'm SJ. SJ is short for Shelley Jane Price, but in Australia, um, Shelley hyphen Jane, way too long. So everyone just calls me SJ. Uh, I lead the AI practice at Sterling and Rose, and my fellow partners know Mark very well from, from Sydney. So, Mark, really, really delighted to be here. Today I want to talk a little bit about the interesting aspects of programmable money. And I also want to take you or propel you into the future and thinking about some of the ethical dilemmas which of course are a portend to what the legal challenges may be with programmable money. Now with digital money, it's incredibly interesting and different from traditional money because of the ability to embed programming into the money to restrict what it does or to restrict who it goes to. For example, to whitelist certain wallets or to blacklist certain wallets or require it to be used for certain things. Now, many of you have probably read the white paper from the Monetary Authority of Singapore and they talk about purpose-bound money, PMB which is a very interesting way of putting programming into money. The composable nature of purpose-based money involves two things. You have your store of value, and wrapped around that, the wrapper has the requirements or the restrictions on it. Now, once that money is used for the first time and those conditions are satisfied, the wrapper drops away and the money can be used in any way by the recipient. So for example, I have some purpose bound money and I can buy some money from, what's your name, sir? Brett. Brett, okay, I can buy something. The, the conditions in it say, I have to give it to Brett, right? I have to buy it from Brett. Once I give it to Brett, the wrapper falls away. Brett, you can use it any way you like. Now, let's though think about the future because I am obsessed with artificial intelligence and in fact the first time I think that Mark and I met each other we were talking about DAOs and talking about the possibility that in the future a DAO will be run and managed by a reinforcement learning algorithm so do you all know what a reinforcement learning algorithm is okay it's a type of it's a type of artificial intelligence it's a type of machine learning but the thing that makes it super exciting is that this algorithm continues to learn and improve to pursue its loss function, meaning the objective that you give it. Now, really important to give it a well-crafted objective because if you get the objective wrong, these algorithms can find ways of meeting the objective, which are ways that perhaps were never contemplated. So I'll give you an example. I create a reinforcement learning algorithm with the objective to eliminate poverty. It's a pretty good objective, right? It could support that objective. But of course, one way to achieve that objective is you kill all the people. Poverty is eliminated, right? So you need to craft your objectives for your reinforcement algorithms very carefully. But as Mark and I discussed, it's certainly possible for you to have these reinforcement algorithms accruing information and data so that they can change what they do and how they do things in pursuit of the loss function or in pursuit of the ultimate objective. So now, let's go to the future. Imagine money that has, let's call it not a wrapper, let's call it embedded in the money so it doesn't drop off when I spend it with bread. For certain, and, and I'm going to use, I'm going to go down the ethical line and talk about it being used for ethical purposes 
and maybe we call it integrity money, for example. Wherever this money goes, it takes these rules about integrity with it. Who would be interested in using integrity money? Anyone here? A few people, yeah, exactly. Now, I'm going to split my focus and ask, has anyone here been to Guatemala? Well, I wouldn't have gone except my husband had to go for work, so I tagged along with him. When we were in Guatemala, we went to see some Mayan ruins, not in the normal place, Tikal, which is the big place, but a place called Yaxa, um, Y-A-X-H-A, with a funny little thing. I, I don't really know how it's, how it's said. To get to these ruins, and they were beautiful, we had to go along this road that was full with potholes, washouts, it was a completely bone-rattling, bone-shaking journey. What our driver told us was that the paving of that road had been paid for three times by government entities, by UNESCO and by other groups. Three times the paving of that road had been paid for and it had never happened. With, with the implications for that community that people tend not to go and visit that area, as you can imagine. So think about programmable money in the future, perhaps with a reinforcement learning algorithm embedded, which identifies areas that you want your money used in or areas that you want to take money from. And now let's explore the ethical dilemmas about that. Now, I need someone to help me here. Can I have three volunteers to come out here? I don't want to oversell it, right? It's going to be probably embarrassing and there is, there's no prize at the end. Is anyone, like, willing to go? Brett, thank you. Thank you, Blaine. Come on. Two people will be fine. Thank you. Now, I'm going to give you two cards. Can you hold this for me? Thanks. All right, here we go. <laughs> no. All right, you get a no card? You get a no card? Yep. Okay. And you get a yes card? Yep. And you get a yes card. Okay. Thank you. Right. I'm going to pose some, some ethical dilemmas. And you have to, the only rule is you have to make a decision and hold up your card. So we're really going to test the boundaries of how this sort of programmable money might be used and what you think about it. Okay. You ready? Here we go. Okay, integrity money is a new type of money which has been programmed with AI so that it can be used only for legal and ethical purposes. Brett, Blang, would you prefer to be paid in integrity currency even though it's worth 2% less than normal cash? Right now? Mm. No, okay. No, okay. What if it was worth exactly the same as normal cash? Right. Oh, still no. Okay, Blaine, we've got to ask you why. Uh, I'd need to know who's, who's, I guess, designing the algorithm, who has control over that. Yeah, yeah. And that's perfect, Blaine, because you know what? With all of these things, it comes down to who you trust, right? Do you trust? So if I said to you, absolutely, we've had the experts look at this, it's been certified, and there are legal rules to make sure it behaves, what would your answer be then? Probably still be nice. Still be nice, okay. <laughs> and what about you, the people sitting down? Would you, would you want to be paid with integrity currency? No. No, most people. Okay, let's try another one. Your much-loved son has just been released from drug and alcohol rehab. And he's here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> he, he asked for money to repair his car, right? And you want to help him out. Would you give him integrity currency, which has been programmed to prevent spending on addictive substances? No, and yes. Okay. Tell us about that. It's a trust issue. Yep. If you're giving with strings attached. Yeah. You're really not empowering him to make a decision. Yeah, yeah. And what about what about you, Blaine? I was just kind of taking my skeptical skeptical hat off a little bit. Yeah. 
So what I, I think whenever we do this, it's really interesting that people have very different views, which I think really portends to some of the ethical and therefore legal issues that we're going to have to deal with. Okay, one last one. You ready for a last one? Here we go. You are a high worth individual. So that's already good, right? It's already hypothetical. <laughs> you are a high worth individual who has spent your life advocating for the abolition of modern slavery. Would you specify in your will that all the bequests of your estate are to be paid in integrity money? Yes, okay. No, all right. <laughs> Blaine, tell us why no. I mean, morality and, and money is a, it's, it's a scary combination. Yeah, it is, isn't it? I think, I think it is. And why would you say yes, Brett? Oh, I'm dead whether I care. <laughs> um, no, I would, I, I would consider that because that would be a statement that might have an impact on the future of integrity money. Mm. If I believed mm. that that was a good concept, mm. then that would send a signal that mm. might be yeah. understood and appreciated yeah. if I were a high net worth individual. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Um, let's give them both a round of applause. Thank you. I'll take your cards. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And that, look, that was just a very short exploration of the sorts of important things that we as a society need to consider, and particularly those of us who are lawyers, and I know there's other lawyers here, these are the sorts of things that we need to consider about how we are going to manage, govern, regulate money in ways that benefit society and individuals. Thanks very much. And next up on stage, where should the maybe? Loud enough? Yeah, so it's out. It's oh, there we go. Yeah, that's loud enough. Um, speakers might have to. I was just testing. It's like there was a, a spot here. It wasn't working. Now it's working. Okay, cool. All good. We've got Phil talking about Cardano next. So come on down, Phil. Everybody, round of applause. Thank you. Um, Welcome everybody. So. Um, First of all, I'd like to apologise because a few, because I presented part of, I presented part of this at the last Karani meetup. So those that have seen it, I apologise, um, but there is some new stuff at the end. So I'm going to talk about uh, decentralised governance. It's a, a new era that uh, Karani is about to embark on, um, and so before we do that, I just thought I'd start off by explaining what Karano is uh, for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, so, uh, I'm just going to do a, a what, why and who of Cardano. So, the what. Um, well, this is a, a commonly used uh, description of Cardano. It's a, the first provably secure proof of stake UTXO smart contract blockchain, which is a bit of a mouthful. So, I'll break down what exactly that means, but before I do, I thought I'd just um, reference a, a popular character online in the Cardano ecosystem and what his opinion of what Cardano is. So, Ada Whale, or Cardano Whale, it was basically said that a lot of people think that Cardano is a competitor for Ethereum, but that's not actually true. Um, it has taken inspiration from Ethereum, but because of its architecture is so similar to Bitcoin, it's actually uh, an extension of what Bitcoin could have been. And it's a, a, a proof of stake version, if you like, of Bitcoin. So the first part of the proof of stake question of what Cardano is, is uh, the consensus mechanism. So uh, it uses a, a novel consensus mechanism called Ouroboros. And um, this is designed in such a way to um, maximize the decentralization of the blockchain. And the way that it works is that people will delegate to a stake pool, um, but it's been designed in such a way that it incentivizes um, if a stake pool gets too saturated, that um, that stake pool will actually start to lose rewards, therefore incentivizing people to move away to a different stake pool. So uh, it's actually um, uh, one of the, the most cited research papers in crypto, the Ouroboros um, paper, so 
from a smart from a proof of state perspective. So it also has liquid staking, and I've used the word true liquid staking because uh, liquid staking seems to have been hijacked <laughs> um, as a term um, by other proof of stake blockchains that um, essentially give you a, a derivative of the underlying um, token in exchange for the token that you're locking up. So Cardano doesn't actually lock your ADA as part of your staking. Um, you are free to use it. It's in your own wallet and you're free to move it at any time. There's no lockup period, there's no slashing. Um, and so it's um, ended up being that because of these features, um, at any given point in time, somewhere between 60 and 80% of ADA is staked, which is obviously what you want. You want as much staking as possible to secure the network. It also has um, what's called an extended UTXO architecture. So what does that mean? Well, many people are probably familiar with what UTXO is. Uh, it was introduced by Bitcoin. So it uh, stands for unspent transaction output. And this is a simple representation of what that looks like. You've got your public key for your wallet and you use your private key to sign a transaction that is spending that unspent transaction output. Okay? And the same applies to, to scripts. Bitcoin has scripts. You can have like a multi-sig where um, the, instead of the public key, you've got a validator and a redeemer, um, which is a, a condition for how you spend that. So the extended part of extended UTXO is actually taking this a step further and it's adding two more features to the UTXO architecture. First one is a, a datum that is a little bit of data that goes along with the UTXO. And this gives um, those UTXOs some state so that smart contracts can actually start to um, do something meaningful with that. And it also um, understands the context of the, um, the transaction that's being performed as well. So um, a smart contract only has to care about um, the local transaction that's happening. It doesn't need to care about everything else that's happening on the blockchain, which is obviously a lot different from the global state architecture of other blockchains. So I've talked about smart contracts and obviously the fact that it's a UTXO blockchain means that the smart contracts can't be the same as uh, smart contracts on Ethereum or other EVM-like chains. So a special programming language needed to be developed for smart contracts on Cardano, uh, something called Plutus. And this is actually developed um, as a form of Haskell, which is a, a functional programming language. Um, it's uh, a lot more robust and uh, used in industries where uh, you want high assurances like aerospace and banking. But a lot of the challenges that have uh, been experienced within Cardano have been the fact that um, not many people know how to program with functional programming. So um, what's happened is that a lot of the community have said, well, we'll try to abstract away some of that complexity. And so now we've got new frameworks like Aitken and Plutus. So Aitken is a, uh, a Rust-like language, and a lot of developers are familiar with how to code in Rust. And Plutus is a TypeScript um, language for developing smart contracts um, in TypeScript. And so this just kind of removes some of that complexity that was uh, the, the hurdle for a lot of people um, becoming uh, smart contract developers on Cardano. So the other uh, unique feature as well is this idea of a native token. Um, so we just heard about programmable money. And this comes from the idea that um, most tokens on most chains are um, actually introduced as part of a smart contract. So tokens on Cardano aren't created from a smart contract. They're actually native to the blockchain and they can be moved around just like the, the underlying um, currency ADA. So you don't need a smart contract to, to create a token. You can obviously interact with smart contracts with the tokens, but it's not actually needed. Um, this is a link to a, a useful website uh, that shows um, some of the features that these native um, tokens have because we have the ability to essentially uh, 
the ability to uh, send different types of tokens in a single transaction. So um, instead of having to have a different transaction for each um, token, um, we can we can send them all in, the, in we can send multiple tokens in one transaction. Hello. Yep. So this is just a, a bit of a snapshot, something uh, from June 21, just kind of gives you a bit of an idea as to kind of activity that's happening at the moment on Cardano. Um, uh, number of native tokens there, 10 million. Uh, Pluto scripts are the smart contracts that I was talking about. Um, just a, a little bit of an insight as to kind of where it is at this stage. So uh, that's the what. So then what about the why? So. Um, Cardano is well known for being this uh, research-based science, um, uh, slow to develop blockchain, um, essentially because um, the, the founder who started Cardano decided that he wanted a, a, a first principles approach to this, um, prove the security model for Cardano before actually releasing anything. And all of the code is developed with uh, formal methods, which is uh, a way of mathematically proving that your code that you're executing um, will actually give you the desired output. This results in, obviously, it being considered quite secure, very secure. Um, the, the method for developing the smart contracts, the underlying chain itself, and this is an important feature for a lot of people who are dealing with money on blockchains because at the end of the day, if you're securing millions, billions of dollars worth of value, um, you want to have the confidence that it is actually secure. And it is sad to, to hear about um, the exploits that happen on other chains, you know, where you're probably counting the millions of billions of, of value that is lost on some of those chains. So it is also considered to be reliable because of these, the way that it's been architected and the way that it's been uh, developed. And um, interestingly, I was uh, chatting to Mark earlier and he pointed out a, a, a tweet that I should highlight as part of this presentation. And I said, I, I actually do have a slide about the reliability of Cardano already. Um, and the point that I, I make about the reliability is it's uptime. So it's been up for, I think this is correct as of today, 2,495 days. It's the second longest running blockchain to, to Bitcoin. and, and the only reason Bitcoin's been up longer is because it's an older chain, obviously. So it's a testament to the reliability. But the, the thing that uh, Mark pointed out was the fact that uh, on Tuesday, there was an attempted uh, attack on the Cardano chain. Somebody tried to uh, essentially spam the chain and um, didn't have the desired effect, unfortunately. The chain continued to run. People continue to mint NFTs, as is uh, the example in this post here. Enmaker is quite a popular uh, NFT minting platform on Cardano. And um, the founder of that platform posted this saying, no one can take this chain down, essentially. Yeah, of course, it slowed down for a little bit because of the, the attack. But the fact that it didn't buckle under that was obviously a testament to that design and, and the way it's been developed. And so the other why is decentralization. Um, somebody asked earlier uh, while we were networking about um, you know, what's important, and this was the answer. Uh, decentralization, if it's not decentralized, then it's web two, and why bother? Um, so obviously, decentralization is many things. Um, there are lots of different ways to measure decentralization. Um, probably one of the most common ones is uh, the number of validators. So this is a snapshot of um, how many stake pools are operating on Cardano and what percentage of the stake they hold. Um, so as you can see, it's very, very well distributed. Um, I think the largest one they're called Avengers. People have speculated that that might be Coinbase's name for their stake pools. Um, and Binance, obviously, there's the second largest. Um, but as I said, there's lots of different ways to measure decentralization. So um, there's a new uh, research division at the University of Edinburgh that have just started what's called the Edinburgh Decentralization Index. And this is a, 
again, a scientific way of actually measuring decentralization for different types of chains. And obviously, there's a lot of online debate about <laughs> what is decentralization and how you measure it. So these guys are basically saying, well, this is all open. Everybody's free to look at their work and, and criticize their work and challenge them. So um, would encourage people to maybe have a look at that and see what you think. Obviously, they, they're not covering all chains at the moment, um, but so, certainly some of the popular ones. So we're at Oz DeFi, um, but one of the things that we found as part of uh, the fact that um, we've got this secure, reliable, decentralized chain is that people now are starting to trust it for more than just DeFi. Okay? And so we're starting to see some examples like recently the Dubai police um, advised that they have started using Cardano to um, record proofs of their ballistics reports on Cardano. Um, it's being used for identity. Um, pe many people are probably familiar with the idea of self-sovereign identity. Um, and uh, these features span many different chains, but obviously, again, um, we've got the Ministry of Education in Ethiopia who uh, actually decided that they were gonna put a lot of their students' um, identity on Cardano because, again, they trust the reliability. And voting solutions. So recently, um, we, we all know about the US elections. Well, some states have decided that they would like to see if they can find ways to, to truly assess the reliability of their voting. So using blockchain as a way to um, ensure that uh, votes are, are calculated correctly um, is obviously a useful approach and something that um, people are looking at Cardano to do as well. And of course, it's not just hype driven. So most of the activity that we see uh, on a lot of blockchains is meme coins, and obviously Cardano does have its share of meme, coin, meme coins. I think there was a new one just recently launched, which was Charles Hoskinson's peak. So, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, the majority of the projects that build on Cardano obviously have come to this chain to build real world solutions because they recognize the reliability that comes from the infrastructure. So onto the who. Um, so the, the founding entities of Cardano, uh, Input Output are the development organization. Uh, the Cardano Foundation obviously doing the community outreach and growing the, the community. And Emergo, um, based out of Tokyo, uh, responsible for um, promoting the commercial adoption of Cardano. But it soon became uh, a very popular chain and the community around Cardano is actually extremely strong. Um, to the extent that that recent attack that um, was talked about uh, on Tuesday, uh, none of the founding entities did anything about that. <laughs> the community of developers actually stepped up and started to identify who this person was, where this, this had come from. Um, so the need for those original founding entities is completely gone. I think uh, Charles even posted that he was just working on his farm while it was happening, so he didn't even know it was happening. So onto de decentralized governance. Um, one of the, the roadmap pillars of the Cardano roadmap was, it was uh, called Voltaire. Um, and uh, this marks the introduction of decentralized governance. Um, it's the last of the, the roadmap um, phases and uh, it's about completely putting control for the chain and the, the chain's treasury into the hands of the community. So I've just put these up as an example of some uh, decentralized governance that's already been in place um, for some time. So people are probably familiar with uh, BIPs, uh, Bitcoin Improvement Proposals or EIPs for Ethereum. Obviously Cardano has its uh, CIPs. Um, so this has been something that's been in place for many years and um, again is a representation of that decentralized governance in, in action already. And then we've also got something called Project Catalyst. Now this is um, being called a, a decentralized uh, growth engine because it's uh, taking funds from the uh, on-chain treasury that Cardano has. Um, every transaction that happens on Cardano 
part of that fee that's collected actually goes into a, a centralised treasury on chain. Um, so some of those funds are being um, put into Project Catalyst where people can put forward proposals about business ideas or uh, development, uh, open source development uh, tools and ADA holders essentially vote for um, which proposals they would like to see get funded. So this is a, a bit of a snapshot as to how many proposals have gone through Project Catalyst to date uh, and how much has been funded. So you can see they've already distributed $46 million um, dollars and there's another 32 already allocated to, to projects. Um, in the current fund, Fund 12, um, they introduced a new category for trying to get some large uh, integration partners um, and they were offering uh, uh, payouts of up to two million ADA uh, for proposals that are successful through uh, through that category. Um, as you can see, um, quite a lot of votes cast on some of these, so it's been slowly growing from Fund 1 through to Fund 12 um, with its uh, adoption. And more recently, uh, so I talked about the three founding entities, um, uh, I think it was the end of last year, um, it was decided that as part of this transition towards decentralised governance and community ownership, um, to actually hand over a lot of the code repositories and responsibility for maintaining the code to a members-based organisation called Intersect. So um, IOG, who originally developed the, the software for Cardano, um, they've relinquished responsibility for that and it's now uh, managed by this members-based organisation. I think there's roughly about 1,500 members um, of type or of an organisational type or of an individual type. And uh, there's different committees for uh, managing different parts of that development work that needs to be done. But this is where the real decentralised governance kicks off. So um, there was a, a CIP introduced called 1694. And the 1694 is apparently the birthday of Voltaire, so that's why it was given that number. Um, this is what is being turned on um, very soon with the Chang upgrade, which is um, supposedly going to be happening within the next month or two. And what this does is it completely puts into the hands of the, the community the ability to um, manage upgrades and um, essentially trigger hard forks and parameter changes. So these are three pillars that were uh, identified that were important as part of this decentralised um, governance journey. So institutions are obviously critical. We all need to work together as under a, a, a common um, banner and that's what obviously Intersect was put in place but we have seen some new members based organisations pop up that are um, forming groups around other interests. Um, constitutional representation, um, so we'll get to what that means um, in, a, in a minute and then obviously democratic consent, so the ability to actually vote on changes. So if I have, if I have stake in this chain, it's in my interest to see it thrive and succeed so I want to have the ability to vote on that, uh, proportionate to what my stake is. So these are some of the governance roles that are being introduced with that hard fork that's happening uh, in a month or two. Uh, first one uh, is delegated representatives. So this essentially will work similar to stake pools, where people will delegate their ADA to someone that they trust, um, can represent them, and it actually introduces this concept of liquid democracy. So instead of having to um, essentially say, well, I want somebody to represent my interests, I want this politician to go and make decisions on my behalf, I'm going to vote for that politician. Um, this allows me to delegate to somebody that I trust. I mean, the vote that's coming up might be a technical change uh, and I don't understand it well enough to be able to vote um, confidently myself. So I will delegate to somebody that I trust who has that. But the ability to just change that for the next vote, um, if I don't like what they did, or maybe the next vote is non-technical. So having this ability just to move your voting power from one place to the next is obviously very powerful. 
This is just a, a, a snapshot of the, um, the dashboard for, um, this is running on, on a test net at the moment for how people will interact with this, uh, connect to their wallet, um, either become a DREP themselves or uh, delegate their voting power to an existing uh, DREP and obviously uh, look at governance actions that have been proposed or propose their own governance action. So if anyone's interested, uh, there's a link there you can go to. Um, you have to have a wallet that supports that particular test net. Um, so one of those other governance roles was something called a constitutional committee. And the purpose of the constitutional committee is to essentially uh, decide whether if, a D if the DREPs vote for a particular action to happen, so somebody puts up a proposal to um, change a parameter so that a block sizes are doubled or something. We'll, we'll go with Bitcoin's uh, legendary uh, fight that they had from a governance perspective. So somebody puts that proposal up and all the DREPs vote, yes, we want to double the size of blocks. The constitutional committee will come in and they'll actually look at a written document, a constitution that the community has already agreed to, to establish whether this action is actually constitutional. There might be something in the constitution that says, actually, you're not allowed to double the block size. I can't imagine why you would have that in the constitution, but you get, you get the drift. So this is an important role, it's a check, to make sure that if there uh, is a potentially a decision that's being agreed to that um, could be harmful based on what the community's already decided should be in the constitution, um, that this group can essentially veto that action. So, as part of the, the hard fork that's happening to introduce this, um, there will be introduced a, an interim constitutional committee and the idea behind this is that um, we need to have an interim constitution until such time as people can start to register as DREPs and, and get delegation to them. So, um, eventually there will be a second hard fork that will introduce um, the ability to approve a new constitution that um, the community will vote on um, and potentially a new constitutional committee will come in to, to replace this existing one. But this is an interim during the transition period uh, of bo essentially bootstrapping governance. So these are the uh, four of seven seats that have already been decided for the constitutional committee and uh, obviously the three founding entities and then the members-based organisation. Um, we just concluded uh, a vote, community vote, to, to find the, the final three seats. Um, so there were 21 candidates that put their hand up to be um, on the constitutional committee. Um, and we found out yesterday that these are the three community elected uh, groups that will uh, act as constitutional committee members. And to, to my surprise and delight, uh, as a member of the Eastern Karana Council, uh, it would appear that I've now got the responsibility of, uh, of looking at these uh, governance actions to see if they're constitutional. So we, uh, we formed um, to put our, throw our hat in the ring as being um, elected for the constitutional committee and um, we were fortunate, we found out literally last night that we've been um, elected, so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But um, obviously one of our selling points was the diversity of our group and the geographical representation that we wanted to bring. Um, obviously the community is very US centric, um, being that the founder is based in the US, um, a lot of the developers are based in the US. So we wanted to bring some geographic uh, diversity and cultural diversity to the group and I think the people who voted obviously recognise that as part of that election process. So we're pretty, pretty thrilled. So I mentioned the interim constitution. It has been released as a, as a document uh, for people to review. Um, there's a QR code if you're interested in having a look. It's 9,500 words or something, so it's a, a bit of a read. But um, uh, it uh, puts all the necessary guardrails in place for being able to ensure that nothing goes wrong as part of this transition in this, um, in this early stage. Obviously, this is a scary uh, change. Um, having a layer one with such a lot of value accrued to it, 
um, essentially being put into the hands of the community, um, things could go wrong. <laughs> so I think um, uh, having some necessary guardrails in there in the first uh, constitution is important. And then ultimately it's up to the uh, community to decide what changes need to be made to that. So as part of that, we will be having some constitution workshops. Um, I'm hoping we're gonna have one here in Perth. I've put in an application uh, to see if we can have one here in Perth. Uh, we've applied to have one in Sydney and one in Wellington as well. Um, and we're hoping to bring people um, who find uh, the intersection between governance and blockchain interesting to come and uh, have a conversation about uh, what could go into this type of document um, to ensure that um, decentralised governance works effectively. So this is just a, a little bit of a roadmap for the for the rest of the year. Um, I think the idea is that there will be at least 50 workshops globally and uh, delegates from each of those workshops will attend uh, a constitutional convention being held in December in Argentina. And I think the selection of Argentina was deliberate because of uh, trying to make a bit of a statement around uh, the benefits that blockchain could bring to a place like Argentina. So um, that's kind of, where we're going. Obviously the, the hard fork happening around July is obviously the, the critical starting point to all this. Um, and then obviously starting to get uh, delegated representatives who can start to put their hand up so people can delegate their ADA. This is just a quick snapshot of the governance actions um, and the different types of people who can uh, participate in those governance actions. So obviously with a, having a constitutional committee, you've got to be able to replace them. <laughs> Um, and also um, potentially have a motion of no confidence as well. So if uh, the community believes that there is a problem with the current uh, committee, then uh, they need to have the ability to force a re-election of them. Um, obviously, updates to the constitution, initiate hard forks, parameter changes, um, and treasury withdrawal. Okay, so this is the most interesting one because as I mentioned, every transaction puts a little bit of ADA in a governance request to withdraw ADA from the Treasury. If it gets approved, it automatically happens. No one can stop it. Okay? At the next epoch's boundary, that is triggered. It's in the protocol layer. No one can stop it. And right now, there's 1.5 billion ADA in that Treasury. So you can appreciate why we want to ensure that uh, these governance actions are managed effectively. Um, if we get a bull market that comes around, that uh, treasury is going to be uh, worth quite a bit. And this is my last slide, just a, an invite to come to the next um, Cardano Perth meetup. Um, it's right here, so that's convenient. Everyone knows where it is. Uh, it's on the 17th of July. Um, we will have... I, I normally just give a, a bit of an update as to things that are happening in the ecosystem. I think Blaine said he's going to do a little bit of a demo on how to buy tokens on Cardano for those who are interested. Um, and we will have a, a spotlight, a project spotlight presentation from Olympus Insights. They're building an education platform on Cardano. So, um, and one of the founders is based here in Perth. So he'll be coming along to that. So thank you. Go. All right. I'm happy for you guys to get a drink while I'm talking. So it's a little bit of a mouge bouche right now. I'm, I'm going to, I'm sure everyone's um, mindful of time. So I'm just going to spend five minutes giving this market update. Now, we would normally have done this at the start of the night, but um, we had to change the order around a little. So, so this is the break. This is the break. You guys get up, have a drink. I'm happy for you all to move around while I'm giving the update, okay? There is only one slide, but there's a lot going on. Take a look while I take you through the market update for this month. So I'm going to start with the picture up here, which is our fear and greed index. And this is going to set the tone for the market update because it actually hit 30 for the first time since September last year, which means there's a little bit of fear in the market. And if we talk about the market and we talk about Bitcoin first, um, we're sitting around um, 61k USD at the moment. The last month we've fallen from 
a peak of, I think we were at 71. So we're, you know, a little bit of fear in the market, yep. And I think that's come from a couple of stories. In the last week in particular, you'll see I've put the German flag up there. But uh, about a week ago, the Germans told us that they were selling off $3 billion worth of Bitcoin that they had seized. So that sent the market into a little bit of a tizzy. At the very same time, a couple of days later, there was an announcement from Mt. Gox saying that they were also going to start paying back their Bitcoin after 10 years and they were going to start paying that back on the 1st of July. So a little bit of FUD or fear and uncertainty and doubt in the market over the last week. Um, and I think, you know, in saying that, we get FUD these days and it doesn't really move the market that much. So we're sitting around that 61K at the moment for Bitcoin. Um, you know, a lot of analysts, a lot smarter than me, think we're probably going to sit around that price for the next couple of weeks, maybe the next couple of months. But if we look at what else is going on in the market, we can take a look at our big ETFs there in red. And we're doing really well there. I think earlier in the month we had some big outflows, but we finished strong in the last couple of days. And if we look at, there were 11 funds uh, that were approved in January. And over the last, um, since January, they've put on 14.4 uh, billion of net inflows. So, I mean, that's pretty staggering, but there's probably a lot more to come. So that's where we are with the Bitcoin ETF. Obviously, the Ethereum ETF has been approved, yet to be traded. There's a little bit of talk from the Bloomberg analysis folk that that'll be approved and ready to go with paperwork um, on the 2nd of July. So who knows really, but that's the date that everyone's talking about for the go live for Ethereum. Is that gonna be a sell the news event? Who knows? We're going to have a pump with F, who knows. But interestingly, Solana um, has had the first um, application in Canada a couple of days ago, followed up, I think last night we got the announcement from Van Eck in the US as well. So no doubt that there will be others to follow. Will there be XRP? Who knows? It kind of opens up the floodgates now. So what else have we got up there? Oh, the US, the, yeah, we had a, little, had a few chats going on about what's going on in the US. I put that up there because obviously um, the US does set the scene with things, um, all things crypto, and they're all making a big play, very supportive of crypto at the moment, so that's important in the landscape. Um, okay, our good mates, um, the Board 8 Yacht Club here, <laughs> These guys who were the darlings of the NFT space um, in 2021, selling for 120F at the time, this last couple of weeks are down to 10F. I think at the peak, they were worth 800K, and that was the cost, I think that was the price, not just the price, but I think the, the tokens that were gifted at the time. So I think, yeah, not too great for those guys. Over here along the bottom, they are new wallets. So there's tw that's, we're trending up. So June just hit the peak of new wallets. Uh, so 28 million new wallets, uh, new, 28 million people holding wallets now, which doesn't seem like a lot when you look at the stats that came out from crypto.com in the last week saying that there's, uh, I think it was 540 million people holding crypto in the world. And to know that we've only got 28 million of those using wallets, uh, it's not a huge amount. Um, what else have we got up there? Oh, meme coins, obviously. Meme coins are still chugging along um, and uh, keeping us afloat. There you go, that was my five minutes. I think I ran a bit over. Awesome, I'm gonna grab the Thank you very much. All right, folks, uh, the next one, we're going to get an update on scams. What's happening in the world of scams from Sophie. Everybody give a round of applause for Sophie. Yeah, just to take things Sorry. up another notch. Who likes a little bit of a high vibe conversation? Look, it just keeps things a little bit real, doesn't it? You know, what's happening in the market. Actually, I wanted to show chain analysis because I think their analysis on what's happening in the market is pretty spot on. So this comes out of their crime report. It's 2023, but it was issued in February of this year. So if you haven't had a look at it, I would recommend you download it, take a look. Now, um, those graphs, they are stacked with a whole variety of different types of um, 
yeah, well, these are transfer of value to illicit addresses. So they've probably been blacklisted at some point or they will be in the process of it or they've been discovered. So in some way, you can see that that chunk in 2022, which is the second from the top under the orange segment, is allocated to F2X. So, so FTX got their own, you know, little allocation right there all by themselves. But the part that really interests us is the second segment from the bottom. Those are where the crypto scams lie. So you can see that it's actually a small proportion of the total. But just to keep everything in context, if you look over to the numbers in red over the other side, um, in 2023, 24.2 billion in you know, transfers to of value to illicit um, addresses, it's only 0.34%. So just to keep everything in context, you know, these are big numbers, but they are actually on the decline. So if you look at the blue from the bottom, it was at a peak in 2021. And then I think in 2022, what was the number there? I just had to write it down. So it was 10.8 billion in 2021. It went down to 6.5 billion in 2022. And then it's at 4.6 billion in 2023. And you might think, well, why Sophie are you talking about this? Well, this is by default one of the specialty areas that I happen to deal with on a daily basis. So I thought, hey, why not just bring it to everyone's attention that, you know, to balance out the hype, um, there is also a need to be vigilant in what you were doing and what others you know were doing in the marketplace. And for the most part, if you look at the three most popular types of scams, they are fake exchanges, investment scams and romance scams. The latter one is on the rise. So I've had several clients who've been involved in those. They're particularly heartbreaking and I don't mean that <laughs> you know, at a pun, because literally there's, there's trust that is engendered by this very, for the most part, I've only had women who've been perpetrating or AI generated images of women, you know, and so who knows who is really behind, you know, that it's probably a team, the language is inconsistent, but people fall in love with these women, um, incredibly beautiful, flawless women, and ultimately the end objective is that you know, whoever the Australian and my clients are from Australia, they're literally opening their hearts, their wallets and paying money into investing in a future with that beautiful um, partner. So, yeah, that's something to just be uh, aware of. However, that doesn't dampen the market as Tracy has talked about, you know, the wallet addresses that are on the rise. And I think in Australia we're in good stead. The Coinly survey this year was saying we're around 31.6% of Aussies are holding accounts um, or wallets, addresses or crypto of some form. So you can see that it's not dampening interest, but it is something to be aware of. So that's my five minute crypto scam update and um, yeah. Balanced view, everyone. Be vigilant. Be vigilant. Uh, Karis Campbell, up on stage. Karis, all the way from the Middle East. Woo. All right. Give me a second. Actually, you hold that mic. Hello, guys. I've absolutely made Karis this event. She has. I invited myself, and then. And it's okay. I've been forced to speak. Yes. <laughs> Actually, uh, I'll move over here. Yeah, that's, that's your bit. So, so first of all, tell us who you are, why are you here? I'm Karis Campbell. I'm a director of capital markets at America Brands. Uh, I live in Dubai and uh, focus predominantly in expanding out to the Middle East. I spent about three weeks of the month in Dubai and about one week in Saudi Arabia. Um, I've worked for America Brands for over a year now. Uh, prior to this, I went in Hong Kong, which is where I what is are. Prior to that, New Zealand, and that's where I really yeah. Yeah. And Woker is a conglomerate, really, of Web3. So, in the main. Sorry, Leo. Oh, this is fun. Um, Just think, ignore. Think about it like a mixture of McKinsey's and maybe like Tencent. So, we have invested in over 502 investments in Web3. I've done 62 deals this year, like, not me personally, but my team. We're very tired. Um, and we also provide advisory services. So when we invest in projects, we also come in, we do tokenomics advisory, we do market making, we run nodes, uh, we'll do PR advisory, we'll help structure, raise capital for them. We're not just cutting a check and saying goodbye, that's not what we do. So we've kind of built this uh, flywheel effect where we invest, we provide advisory, and we bring it to market from there. 
And then the same new spectrum that we're doing a lot at the moment is working with governments. So I spent a lot of time like speaking to uh, to my blockchain center down in Abu Dhabi, and then a lot of time Saudi Arabia, Arabia speaking to um, me. So it's a uh, variety of other different acronyms that seem not to make any sense. Um, and in, sorry, just very quickly, in Hong Kong, we speak to HKMA and others that want to talk about things like CBDC, so so forth. You, you've been there for how long now? Oh, I mean, uh, overseas in, oh, in the Middle East oh, okay. and, and Hong Kong. Yeah, I've lived in three countries in 18 months. My tax is a mess. Um, but now I don't pay any, so... <laughs> so speak, uh, apart from the tax stuff, that was, the, that was pretty much half the, the meet-up in Brisbane was all on tax because it's that time of the year. But um, I wanted to ask you, not on tax, but more uh, because you've been overseas and you were working here, what's the kind of differences that are really stark and, you know, that um, you could share with us? Okay, when you might not like this, but this is my opinion. Um, I think Australia is uncommercial for blockchain and crypto projects. Um, you don't get access to funding here, networking is very difficult, but there's no government support, no regulation support. When the ASIC aren't even coming to the table or responding to your phone calls, and they're the ones that are supposed to be regulating you, it's very, very difficult to have an open conversation. So that's my opinion. When it comes to Hong Kong, I think the government there would have uh, most have one of the best reputations uh, in regards to um, their ability to, to execute. So, of course, Hong Kong has always been the gateway of finance for China, and crypto is no different. So, they've really had a big change over the last 12 months around how they think about crypto, um, and they're trying to expand there. So, if you've got a project that's probably somewhere in like the RWA space or something along those lines, I think Hong Kong would be a good, good decision for you. When we looked at the Middle East, oh, it's a very large area. So let's just keep it to the UAE. I would split Dubai and Abu Dhabi into two different sections. So, I mean, I'm sure you guys know, but um, Dubai isn't a country and lots of Australians think that all the time. So uh, when we think about Dubai, that is, in my opinion, like the hot, the melting hot pot of crypto in the world. Like if you've got a project, if you want funding, if you if you want to start up network, that's where you go. Not right now because it's summer and it's really bloody cold right now, but come October to April, there's two, three crypto events every single day across the city. It's crazy. Um, they have Lara, the virtual advisor, virtual, advisor, virtual asset regulator, um, which provides obviously if you've got an exchange, if you want to do prop trading, if you want to be a market maker, they provide a license for you and you can set up there. Um, Abu Dhabi, different. The growing up version of Dubai, this is where all your sovereign wealth funds are. Um, there, you'll be able to, like, if you had a startup, honestly, I would probably go and apply to Hot 71 down there. That's a government backed incubator. It doesn't have to be in crypto, it can be in anything. If you get accepted, they'll provide you with visas, they'll set you up with accommodation, they'll subsidize your OPEX. It, to me, it's a no brainer. If you've got a Web3 gaming company right now, I'd be playing by, uh, buying by AD Gaming and I'll do the same thing. So, and Abu Dhabi is a great place to live. Like, these are the incentives that governments provide for startups. You, I personally you just don't see this in Australia. You definitely don't. And um, there was even like some other government incentives. I think it was Dubai that was doing some fast track visa sort of thing if you were going to open up like a business there. But I think that may have closed off. But there's always these uh, interesting opportunities. Going back to, uh, I mean, the sell there was that have to look into it. Um, question? One, one sec. Oh, no, 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 because otherwise it's not going to go on. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers, Kat. Just interested where you see Singapore in that. You mentioned Hong Kong. Singapore as well. I see it very similar to Hong Kong, right? Um, it wants to reopen up. It's been burned. It's put the crypto out. Um, and it's reopening <laughs> again. Um, again, if you are a startup, they do, funnily enough, it's not called Hub 71, but it's like Startup 71 in Singapore, I believe it's the name. It's another 71. Again, you can get um, uh, support and funding, introductions to VC, OPEX support, so forth out there as well. Um, and again, it's an, it's an, they have a better regulatory environment than you see against Australia. Uh, just last question for you before uh, you, um, you know, you, you jet off tomorrow, so appreciate uh, having you here. Uh, where do you see the market going? Your opinion and, um, yeah, right, you, crystal ball. Okay, um, financial advice, folks. <laughs> Not financial advice. 
Uh, and obviously it could be totally wrong, but I actually think about halfway through a whole day right now. So when I think about like when I'm investing in product dealers as well as when I'm like investing in liquid, I think that we're already halfway. So, but what I do see is the same liquidity just refunding through different deals all the time. And um, I mean, Tracy would know more than me in regards to the retail market coming in. Um, but yeah, I mean, you've already seen all time highs, you've already seen main coins being pushed, like ETH, easy at blah, blah, blah. You guys know this already. Um, but like for me personally, I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm going to start flipping a little bit. Whereas last year I was like really, and this is absolutely not financial advice, investing every single cent that I had. And like a little bit worried I'd have to pull my brother for money um, to pay for food. So now I'm like, okay, I think now I want to have a little bit more dry powder um, and fully back a little bit. And I'll probably, again, this is my personal advice. Like I will think about reducing private deals because it's so long for you to get all your tokens invested in that period. And I'll think about like just doing liquid stuff. But who knows? Calling family for food when you can't afford sounds like a startup founder. But um, Karis, thank you so much for, for joining us and uh, everybody round of applause for Karis. Cheers. If I could get Leo up to the stage, please. Thank you so much. So yeah, tonight we, um, you will learn how to set up a non-custodial uh, Tezos wallet. So yeah, we're trying to get those non-custodial wallet numbers up, get funds off exchanges, and learn about um, staking Tezos to secure the network. Hello. Yeah, Thanks. Just before. Thank you. And what sets Etherlink apart from other Layer 2s? Um, and we're going to look at a few layer one and layer two DeFi projects on Tezos. So just to define a few terms, <coughs> uh, exchange, it's a place where you go to buy or sell crypto for anyone who's new here. Um, popular ones, Coinbase, Kraken. Layer one is um, kind of, it's like, like Bitcoin, it's the main chain. Like Tezos is a layer one. There are things called layer twos. Um, you might have heard of some like Arbitrum, uh, which is an Ethereum. Ethereum is a layer one, um, but Arbitrum is like a layer two to Ethereum. And so, yeah, on Tezos, we have smart roll ups, and Etherlink is a layer two. So yeah, non-custodial wallet, it's, it's the wallet that you get and you get those words, you've got to make a backup of them and try not to lose it. Easier said than done. Smart contracts, um, thank you Phil, covering uh, that in the Cardano kind of makes my job a bit easier. But yeah, it's, it's basically the, um, the way that NFTs are, are um, are built um, and DeFi, decentralized finance. So it's how the logic is coded into programming language. Um, block, uh, so yeah, fundamental to the blockchain. A block is, is like a container for the transactions and for the smart contracts. So the smart contracts like NFTs or, or decentralized finance. Um, platforms, they all get put into blocks on the blockchain, which is just a sequence of these blocks. And so Tezos is a proof of stake um, network like Cardano. Um, it's been a pioneer in, in this space um, with also a delegated um, staking system. And it's recently just upgraded to have a separate staking system, which I'll talk about shortly. And so staking rights, um, when you stake, you get kind of rights that are a few, a couple of weeks into the future, and then your, your um, wallet will get the rewards. 
<coughs> and slashing. So uh, slashing is when your stake is penalized if your um, if your staking node misbehaves. So that's a risk. It's pretty low. You probably don't need to worry about it, but it's worth mentioning. And Tezos has on-chain governance from the start. Uh, it's been running for over five years, and and it's upgraded 16 times, forklessly. So there's no hard forks in Tezos. The the protocol is actually upgraded on the fly. Um, all the nodes download it simultaneously. It's quite elegant the way they've done it. And if you want to have a look at some of those protocol amendments, I encourage you to scan this code. Um, there's quite a lot of technical information there. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. So I'll, I'll just leave that up for a few seconds for anyone. OK. Here's a, just a, a video goes for a minute. It talks about the different L2s. So all these layer twos have multi-signature smart contracts with the key holders in, in the kind of t five to 10 amount of people who would need to collude to steal all the, all the TVL, all the total value locked on those chains. Um, and with Tezos Etherlinks, Tezos Etherlink layer two, there's, there's no um, smart, con well, there's no, uh, multi-signature smart contract. It's, it's actually safeguarded by the layer one validators. And that video is available as NFT on um, object.com, which is Tezo's largest marketplace, NFT marketplace. Um, so the new staking role I was talking about before is kind of uh, synonymous with delegating. Um, so now we have adaptive issuance. So the number of Tezos that comes every year is adapting depending on how many people are staking. Yeah, I mentioned that. Um, here's a, just a quick comparison table showing uh, the difference between staking and delegating. So if you're a delegator, you only get half as many rewards now. So that's actually taking place right now. Um, I haven't yet, I run a, a, a node, and so I, I have to like manually send the rewards to all my delegators. So I, when I get back home tonight, I'm gonna send the, the delegators rewards and they're gonna get half as many starting from today. So I expect there'll be more people looking into staking to get <coughs> higher rewards. And this is just, um, you can see, is this, is this, oh, I just need to hold it closer. Hmm. So, yeah, there's less than 1%, um, <coughs> less than 1% of people who are actually staking. <coughs> so the, this is um, a blockchain explorer, TZKT, and you can see, yeah, there, um, that's the API for stakers. The, that number on the left is for delegators. So stakers are getting twice as many rewards. It's a pretty cool site. It plays some chill music and has a nice background and it shows you how many Tezos are staked. So yeah, this is a pretty good Tezos wallet. They've got a mobile app, um, for iOS and Android and a browser extension for Chrome and Brave browsers. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to scan that code if you haven't got the Temple Wallet already. 
Otherwise, just remember Temple. Thank you. <laughs> Getting people into non-custodial Tezos wallets. Oh yeah, download the Tezos wallet app. This is really the main aim of my presentation tonight, by the way, <laughs> to get people to get some Tezos wallets. Fine, okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and if you stake some Tezos, that'll just make me very happy. If, you don't even need to stake with me. Just set up two Thank you. <laughs> Got to get those metrics up. <laughs> All right. So yeah, that's what it looks like. You click receive and then you get your Tezos address. And then you go to your exchange, this one's Kraken. We draw the Tezos, get it into your hands, and then, did I not put the URL here? This is stake.tezos.com. So that's how you stake. Um, you can visit that website also on your phone or, yeah. There it is, go to stake.tezos.com. Okay, so yeah, I'll just cover some of the L1s, um, L1 DeFi applications on Tezos. So this is um, TZBTC, uh, I can't remember if it's .io or .com, sorry, but Google it and you can basically bridge your Bitcoin onto the Tezos network and it's safeguarded by like five very reputable exchanges, I think most of them in Switzerland. Um, so yeah, you can get your Bitcoin onto Tezos and, and do DeFi like liquidity baking. And that's, they rebranded it because I don't know, I think it was too confusing with staking, baking. Staking and baking is pretty much the same thing. Uh, well, it's not the same thing, sorry. Yeah, it, they, it got confusing, so they changed it to serious decks. It is serious. <laughs> it's a very serious DeFi application. This there's about 18 million in in uh, value that's locked up in, well, not locked, but it's it's pretty liquid. But anyway, um, this the point I'm trying to make about this. Um, you get here from the TZ. KT blockchain, um, and you click on DEX um, after searching for Sirius. And uh, this is protocol subsidized kind of funding that, so every block, two and a half Tezos comes into the, uh, into this contract. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. And I, I think that's about $2 million every year subsidized to these people. Um, yeah, decentralized funding of, of Bitcoin and Tezos, that pair. Uh, I really like this one. Um, you can see 62% APR is, is a bit ridiculous, um, but that's what I'm doing. I'm locking up some funds for a year and a half, I think. Um, there's only four and a half million of these governance tokens, so that's really quite small. And so yeah, that's basically synthetics. You can, you can get the governance token for free just by um, borrowing USD using Tezos as collateral. I've done that before. It's extremely stressful, um, especially since that was during the, the lunar collapse. And I came within a cent of being liquidated <laughs> and we're on holiday, so there's nothing I could do about it. But um, yeah, that, they're actually working on a 2.0 version and that's supposed to be launching soon. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, look, staking is, is really like the easiest kind of, this is if you want to kind of go to the next level. Calibri is another kind of similar platform. Um, although it's worth mentioning, I think, yeah, they've also got a synthetic Bitcoin token. Um, and I think they've also got, yeah, they've also got a gold token. Um, which you can only uh, mint, I think, when 
the gold markets are open. Anyway, they use oracles. Um, this one's just USD. So you put your Tezos in the oven and you can borrow USD at 2.5% and then you can put it into use and earn 18%. This is a relatively new one. And all these are audited, by the way. Actually, I'm not sure if Calibri is audited. Anyway, um, this one's audited. Yves is audited. And this is a DEX aggregator, still layer one, uh, three route. Um, you end up getting 25% better uh, prices. All right, Etherlink, layer two. So non-custodial, yeah, we kind of went through that with the, that video. Um, it's got MEV protection, so that's very good if you'd like to keep your trades, like have most of the money in your trades going, like not to some um, bot, botter. Like, there's this guy, Jared from Subway, who's heard of him? Only one person's heard of Jared from Subway? Jared from Subway. I thought we don't speak his name anymore after the whole stuff that he was going through. Oh, what was that stuff? Uh, was the hand of the You're talking about actual Subway guy? Yeah. Are you referring to the, the MEV guy? I'm referring to the MEV guy. Oh, right. I thought, yeah. Okay. Sorry, yeah, I didn't get the reference. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't look it up. Okay. Thank you for warning me. <laughs> so yeah, none of those other L2s, I wore, there's, there's probably some that claim that they've got MEV protection. Actually, I'm not 100% sure if Etherlink actually has MEV protection from day one. I should mention, Etherlink has just launched like the beta like, like a couple of weeks ago. So this is all very nascent and like literally today, one of these platforms, uh, this is just an integration that the Tezos Foundation has worked with these guys to provide Etherlink to more wallet, wallets. Um, oh, I can't, I'll talk about that later. Anyway, um, this is a comparison just showing how fast Etherlink is at the top there. Um, the, the block time on on Tezos is now 10 seconds. Uh, it's been getting gradually dropped down with each protocol upgrade. So, and they're gonna bring that down even further um, with the ultimate vision to be able to, to have very quick um, transactions and a layer two that can handle, they're trying to converge on a one single layer two that's gonna be able to handle a million transactions a second And I thought I'd just point out this. I'll let you read it. Sorry. So yeah, your vote is not your vote. On Arbitrum, the, they voted not to pay and then and they're like, well, we kind of already spent the money. <laughs> so, I mean, all, all of these other L2s, like the ma majority of them have a governance token and the thing with Etherlink is it doesn't have a governance token because it doesn't need one. It, it inherits all of the governance from the L1 of Tezos. That's why we call it um, an enshrined optimistic roll-up. So this is the Etherlink bridge, how to get some Tezos onto your MetaMask. So you connect your Temple wallet for Tezos and your MetaMask for Etherlink, and away you go. This is Organic Growth, which is a pretty cool meme coin site. It's just popped up. Um, I bought some of this Etherlonk. <laughs> it's officially the unofficial token for Etherlink. <laughs> and I'm happy because it's going up.
and it costs about two Tezos to, to launch your own meme coin on organic growth. .wtf, so I encourage you all to spend two Tezos and launch launch a interesting project. And this is the thing I was kind of trying to layer to. Um, oh yeah, just today, DeFi Llama has listed this project, which is the first Etherlink. Um, project to, to be tracked on DeFi Llama, so that's, that's great. It's very nascent. It's, I think there's only $10,000 worth, worth of funds a lot in there. So I've added my no coin and five Tezos worth of <laughs> liquidity in there. Um, Hanji, I was listening to a podcast uh, with, with this guy who's talking about how um, with, with Tezos, the way that the, the, the gas kind of op is optimized, they're going to be able to do on-chain order books, which is not going to be possible on a lot of the other ones because um, they run into to constraints. Something about logarithmic. It is quite technical and, I, I, yeah. But I'm, obviously they haven't launched yet, so anyway, that's this project I'm following. And Plend, um, they also have a layer one uh, DeFi thing called Plenty, and they have a, a wallet as well. Um, I tried to do staking and it didn't work. It's just, I mean, the staking thing is, is new, like literally it's just come in, so all the wallets kind of rushing to, that's why I recommend Temple, because I tested it out, it works. Um, but yeah, this is all on the test net blend. And I'll just end with some kind of high level overview of Tezos. So you can see they're, they're trying to build to include as many developers as possible um, in languages that developers use like JavaScript and Python, Java. Um, they have their own runtime as well, Nicholson, that's also formally verified. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's functional. So for, for higher value applications, you probably want to use a layer one smart contract and, and do it in Nicholson. Um, yeah, I don't know how many smart contract developers there are. Any smart contract developers? Oh, check, check out um, SmartPy, LIGO. Those are, those are some of the tools. Um, on the DAO, not the DAO, the DAO. The data availability layer. So that's just um, basically making available the data from the rollups to people who want to check that the transactions are actually legit. And this is kind of how Etherlink, or smart rollups, how they how they interact with Tezos. Um, I'm not going to pretend to fully understand this, but uh, I just thought it's it's interesting to see kind of. I mean, the the layer one has a shared inbox. I understand that. And so basically, it's good for composability. So all of the rollups will be able to check with the layer one that things are there, if that explains it. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't come up with a better explanation. <laughs> and um, there's my email address. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Grab that off you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, take a seat. Guys, there's so much knowledge in here, in this room. It is ridiculous. Uh, just give me a sec. I'll, I'll do the, rather than click, click. I forgot I can just jump back on the computer and do this. So I'll do some roundup and stuff now. 
But um, one of the things that I want you all to just remember with all of this is that the main thing that you gotta do when you come to these events is network with someone else, like learn something new, even if it is just that next connection, that LinkedIn, that Telegram or whatever you wanna connect on because I think the, the most powerful thing about all of this is growing the community. That is the strongest thing because with community comes knowledge, comes all these cool projects and things you can collaborate on. Um, before I round out, just uh, if you allow me a few minutes, I just want to tell you about something that we're working on. So I don't just run the community here because I get zero from that. And like Karis has just left, if I get paid zero, I'd have to um, um, go to mum's house all the time to get leftovers. I do that anyway, but um, I don't, you know, the food that she gives me on Sunday lasts up until Wednesday, so I need to work, guys. Um, speaking of collaboration, so I, I work for a company called Not Centralized. Uh, we've done quite a few things in the NFT space, working on projects for restaurants, for an electric vehicle reseller, for a whole heap of other things as well. Um, we were part of the CBDC um, pilot project where we were one of the ones that really wanted a private version of the CBDC where it was nothing more than proof of reserve and Stablecoin had the programmability and there was a real world construction project done on that. This takes some of the stuff that we did there. There's no CBDC in this, so don't worry. But the idea is that um, let's have a think about how blockchains kind of work, right? They're not anonymous. They're not confidential by nature. They're pseudonymous. So if Leo and I, we do a transaction on a public uh, blockchain, he can see my wallet, I can see his, I can see a history of transactions. That's cool for retail. Um, but if I'm a business and, you know, I'm, I'm a cafe and, now all of a sudden you can see all these different transactions that I've got, you can start to tell margins. So confidentiality is actually really important. Um, one of the things that we did as part of the RBA project, because we saw that you can't have anything, whether it's CBDC, stablecoin, anything like that, businesses will not use it unless there's confidentiality. So we had to build as part of that an EVM compatible zero knowledge proof. So it's not a zero knowledge proof that sits off chain, it's something that sits on chain. And as part of that learning, we've been able to come up with a new project that we're partnering with with some other people. So the ZK proof is selected disclosure. Hands up who knows what a ZK proof is or has heard of it. A few of you, for the ones that don't know, imagine that you go into a nightclub and right now you have to show your full license. I can read that if I'm the bouncer. Now imagine another situation where it's a ZK proof. They ask you, are you older, uh, old enough to actually get into this place? And all you're saying is true, false. Your data is not actually being sent. So there's cryptography involved in that. So if you think about that, um, click, oh, there we go. So we built something called Layer C, which is natively confidential, it's selective disclosure. So it's a tokenization engine. There's also digital escrows in there, which is what we did with the RBA pilot. Digital escrows, like in the real world, you don't do escrows on little crappy um, $10,000 construction projects because it's not worth getting the lawyers, the banks, the accountants involved. With blockchain, it doesn't matter, you can do it at that level. So we have protection in, uh, supply chain. So that's what Layer C is. We partnered with Red Belly Network, which is a KYC um, Australian built out of academics here in Australia uh, blockchain platform, and they're starting to grow really well. So Red Belly Network's really interesting. It's fully KYC. That's important for the people that want to use it. There's other people that don't want KYC blockchains. That's fine. The key thing about all of this, whether it's Tezos, it's all these things that are being shown, Phil with Cardano, everything, it's optionality. That's the beauty of all of this kind of stuff. We don't just get stuck with only the one kind of payment network or, or rails. You've got optionality there. Red Bell is really important. That's a blockchain we're working with. Maneuver is massively important as well because Maneuver is the on-ramps and off-ramps. Without that, the real world um, could not use this. And so all three of us are working on a project where we're coming together uh, to bring our speciality to tokenize something. It's something called rent rolls. So if you're a landlord, um, your invoices, they're called rent rolls. Australia is a big commercial and um, real estate kind of nation. We love our real estate. As, as it's as up there as sports and, and whatnot. Um, there's $2.7 billion worth of rent rolls. Um, they're going to be tokenized uh, whenever we finish that project in a few months. So you think about the biggest tokenization projects out there. This is going to be right up there. It's going to be bigger than a lot of other ones that are overseas. Um, this is really going to help put Australia on the map. So I just want to share this with you now as a preview before it really goes out into the news and you can see more info about it because this is what's happening. You know, there are things where they're manual, they're not digital, they're really inefficient. This is what blockchain can do. 
So it's quite powerful stuff. And I think the key from all of this is that you've got different options. This could be done. It doesn't have to be on Red Belly. It could be on another network. It could be, you know, they've chosen Red Belly because for this situation, they need that KYC element. It could be Cardano for something else. But the point is problems that you're looking to solve, you've got all these great building blocks. So I just wanted to share that. And then um, as we round out, thank you so much everyone for sticking around. We're gonna do some networking now, but I just wanted to tell you all, and thank you for signing up on Luma for all of this, uh, that um, we're gonna be doing much more stuff on Luma. The reason why is Meetup is great. I'll still push, we will still push out messages there. So if you sign up originally on Meetup, you'll still get calendar messages and, and emails. Um, it's just that we, we wanna sign up on, and do more on Luma because it allows us to have our own calendar. Everything else was really manual before. If you can imagine three different groups where, because with Meetup I can do a max of three groups um, per login. So I had three logins to manage the seven cities. It's, it's not just to ease my pain and stuff, um, but it's also to ease uh, the pain for which like people go, where's your calendar? And we have to keep on updating. If we didn't update the calendar, which we had in Notion, then people just didn't see the events. Now, if you go to the Aus Depot Association QR code, goes to a link tree, the first calendar on there is Luma, and everything's just gonna be on there. So we're always gonna update the Perth ones. If you're traveling to Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney, we're doing four cities this year. We do have Newcastle, Canberra, Adelaide, but they're a bit smaller communities, but they're starting to grow a little bit. So, um, and if anyone is interested in, you know, uh, connecting more with us and, you know, becoming part of this, um, please do hit up Sophie and Tracy. Sophie wants to come up and just do a little announcement. Yeah, it's actually acknowledgement to Bambu. I just can't look at my LinkedIn and I didn't realise like I've just given some love to your announcement. So because our COO and the CEO is here, well Blake's not here, but Tracy, really want to acknowledge what you published concerning Bambu have won the We Money Crypto Awards 2024 for the best for Roundup investing in cryptocurrency. So wonderful achievement. Round of applause, folks. Amazing, and, and as Sophie said, there's amazing people that are here that have been helping us. Um, you know, Kat Dunn, who was a pioneer in moving over from Sydney to here and partnering with Bamboo and, and Sophie. And uh, there's just uh, Ronan's here as well, who's uh, helped us with the mics. You can hear us now because of Ronan's, so you can thank him for the hearing. Um, and you know, all the amazing things you're doing uh, at HBAR Suite. So, there's a lot of really cool things happening. I have recorded this, so this will be on YouTube whenever I get to edit it. Um, as much as I work in the AI space, there's still a lot of stuff I do manually. If anyone wants to help with anything that we're doing, please uh, you know, talk to us in the continued networking. And uh, that is it. Thank you so much, Perth. <laughs>